Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where your rabbi, that would be me, reveals how the world really works. And that is especially for you. And one of the ways the world really works is that, uh, as is often said, one could never be too rich or too thin. Well, of course, uh, like all attempts to compress vast wisdom into uh, a single slogan or one sentence, uh, it obviously falls short in, in many ways, including the fact that you can be too thin, uh, you can be unhealthily too thin, and you can certainly be too rich if too rich means that you sacrificed vitally important parts of your life by overemphasizing the significance of wealth. We've, uh, we've spoken a number of times on this show about wealth, I have uh, a number of books and audio CD programs on the creation of wealth and on uh, increasing revenue, uh, and I'll remind you a little later on of my website. You can go and explore that if you like. But today, in this show, I want to speak about thin. I want to speak about losing weight. As a matter of fact, I want to speak about the only way to reliably lose weight. There are so many diet programs and exercise programs and gym programs, and, and they all promise these extraordinary results. But uh, as most of you have probably discovered, they all fall short. Eventually, they don't work. And yes, you can certainly watch infomercials on late night television and encounter before and after pictures of individuals who've, who've gone through these programs. And uh, it's very possible that for those individuals, um, it did work, but it doesn't work for the majority of people. And uh, the reason is because the truth is everybody knows how to lose weight, right? Exercise more, eat less. End of story. That's all you got to do. And so it sort of seems as if the problem with those of us who could stand to lose a few pounds, it seems as if the problem is simply just a case of lack of willpower, no self-control. We eat and eat and eat, and we sit in front of the blasted television set, and we don't exercise. So guess what? the belly bulges. I mean, what do you expect? That's what it sounds like. But um, it's not quite as simple as that. Yes, it may be true that I do know that the secret to losing weight is eat less, exercise more. But weight loss isn't the only area where failure to follow through is the problem not lack of information. Uh, you know, whether it's Bernie Madoff, the, the notorious uh, uh, financier who, who uh, engaged in a massive uh, fraud and Ponzi scheme, uh, or, or whether it's the very colorful Alan Stanford, uh, the, the Texas um, good guy, nice guy, who became a Caribbean-based financier and banker and was convicted of charges of uh, fraud and Ponzi schemes and so on. And so, uh, you know, he's serving a prison sentence that, that ends sometime after the, uh, after the year 2100. And Bernie Madoff is serving a sentence that also is going to go on uh, for a lot much longer than he can possibly live for, but it's also uh, folks who who have uh, uh, carried out far less notorious and far smaller schemes uh, that have come to grief. In all of these cases, whether it was Madoff or Stanford or all the smaller people, everybody knows that what they were doing was wrong, right? I, 
it, it, that's almost never in question. And so if one would have gone to them and said, hey, look, you know, you know the secret of staying out of jail. Just don't defraud and don't do Ponzi schemes. That's all. And you're fine. That's, that's all you got to say. The trouble is they knew that. They knew that. But the desire to do it, the emotional pull to do it, exceeded the intellectual restraint. And the same could be said to be true of, um, uh, of weight loss as well. The emotional desire to eat and the emotional reluctance to exercise defeat the intellectual knowledge of what it is one should do, which simply drives home to us the very simple reality that human beings are not computers and we're not cars, we're not machines. Yes, if you want your car to perform a little differently, uh, perform a little more dramatically, more exciting acceleration, perhaps a better top speed, at the cost of wearing out more quickly and using more fuel, then all you do is you hack the chip. And there's, uh, because cars today are computer controlled, very often different cars made by the same manufacturer with different performance ratings have exactly the same engine, but it's just programmed differently. And so uh, it's not hard to either buy a suitably programmed chip to replace the one in your car or to learn how to reprogram the one in your car. This people do this all the time. Uh, folks, it does avoid your warranty. So I just wanted to let you know about that. But uh, the fact is that it's not that hard to hack a car. Uh, you, you, you can hack your computer. You can, you, you, there are tricks and, and little dodges you can use when it comes to machines uh, in which you can make changes. Yes, you can. But people are not cars or computers or any other form of machine. And so, you know, imagine... Um, a guy saying, look, you know, uh, Rabbi Lappin, I really want to uh, learn how to, I want to meet a woman and get married. I really want to do that. And I'm just, I'm shy. I don't know how to meet girls. And, uh, you know, I talked to him a little bit and it turns out that he's been singing the same song for 25 years already. At this point, I'm thinking to myself, he thinks that there are a few little tricks. He thinks that there are some little sentences or opening chat lines or pickup lines that I can teach him and that uh, all he needs is an upgrade of his wardrobe and he's got to learn to look a little cooler. And by the time he's had a makeup of his appearance and a makeup of the, uh, his opening lines, he is set to go. And there's no reason why he won't be married in a year's time, right? Wrong. That's entirely wrong. Because it's not the little tricks you have, it's what you are. That's what makes all the difference. And, um, and when he, uh, he tries his little pickup lines in wearing his new cool outfits, it's not going to take any woman you know, very long at all to discover that this is all veneer. This, this is, there is no substance underpinning what, what he's projecting on the outside. The only way that works is to change your very nature. You actually have to, you'll pardon me using this phrase, because I don't mean it in a religious sense, but I mean it in a spiritual sense. You have to kind of be reborn is really what it's all about. And, um, and so the, 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 the people who, who defraud, the people who, uh, who uh, make these mistakes, uh, they knew about all of that. The problem wasn't what they didn't know. The problem was what they were not. Um, do you really think, do you really think that when uh, teenage girls get themselves pregnant and have babies, do you really think they had no idea of the perils <laughs> of, uh, of physical relationships? Is that likely? 
after all the time and money their silly high school their silly pod me geek their silly government indoctrination camp spends on teaching sex education don't you figure that by now they kind of probably got that figured out again uh, when girls get pregnant uh, in high school it's not because of something they didn't know it's because of something they were or were not depending on how you want to look at it uh, when uh, when their brothers engage in theft and robbery is that because they don't know that that's illegal is it because they have no idea that that starts you on a road to a lifetime doomed career as a petty criminal no of course they know that the problem is not what they know or don't know the problem is what they are or are not and so similarly my friends the reason that the overwhelming majority of weight loss programs don't work for most people oh there are some people for whom they do there's no question about it. there are the outliers they're the occasional people who for either certain body type or, or certain metabolisms or uh, with superb self-control uh, do somehow manage to 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 lose weight on those uh, on those programs but do they keep it off different story entirely and I think everybody knows how frequently uh, that part fails where you undergo on a frantic pre-summer diet and exercise program you're really gonna get in shape and uh, and you pretty much are for for the summer you you spend three months January February March April four months oh you really worked hard you starved yourself you exercised. comes uh, spring and then the summer and oh you're terrific uh, and then comes October November December and guess what for most people the weight pops right back I'm, I shouldn't laugh this is uh, it's terrible it's painful people really suffer and uh, everybody most most adults go through this and so the problem again is not what you know or you don't know right there's not a single one of us who doesn't know that the avenue to weight loss is eat less exercise more that's it and you can play around with your protein diets and your carbohydrate diets and this and that all of these are designed to make it easier for people with inadequate willpower and so yes you can eat and, and then there are kinds of their their various drugs and medications to take that fool your stomach into feeling that it's full and again if if these things really worked reliably for everybody uh, they would be widely known and the uh, manufacturers or inventors uh, would be regular features on the celebrity circuit but uh, the bottom line is that these are all um, hopeless and uh, and inadequate solutions to the weight loss problem this show I'm going to share with you the secret of losing weight it's the only effective way of reliably losing weight and keeping it off and the reason that it is, is quite unique is because it focuses not on the hacks and the tricks it focuses on the reality of changing not just what you know not even just what you do but what you are or perhaps more grammatically who you are okay that's uh, by way of intro so you know where we're going in this particular show I want to thank you for your loyal participation in the show and uh, particularly for the successful way that so many of you are promoting the show by getting other people interested in the show and and that way we've become a like-minded community that uh, today is very large over a quarter of a million people listening to this show with some degree of regularity which is incredible and um, uh, really I've done no promotion at all it's all been you telling your friends and associates uh, and relatives about the show so thank you very much for that and uh, recently several of you have also been asking uh, what can you do what should you do if you 
want to make a major gesture of affiliation with the show and with the project of making ancient Jewish wisdom accessible to a broad range of people in the areas of faith, family, finance, fitness, and friendship. And uh, the answer is, what you should do is you should buy the digital download library pack. There is more than 35 hours of practical wisdom uh, and our America's Real War ebook. Uh, you can hear and see me and Mrs. Susan Lappin as we teach on the five F's. And so, uh, uh, how do you do that? Well, first of all, I should tell you what's what's in, more of what's in it. Um, there are twelve separate audio teachings. Uh, there's three downloadable DVD programs. There's an ebook, and there is a ten-hour video course on financial prosperity. And if if you were to buy these things separately, as people do, it would be just under five hundred dollars for the whole lot. Obviously, uh, with the sale price, we're not talking about anything anywhere near that. And not only do you get the 10-hour video program of the Financial Prosperity Collection, and not only do you get America's Real War, the ebook, but you also get the Biblical Blueprint, which is five audio teachings. And uh, by the way, really worthwhile listening to, uh, at, at very least, I mean, let me tell you, Instead of watching television or, a, or a, a video, listening while you go to sleep, you'd be astonished how much you're actually able to recall. Uh, and so these five are Let Me Go. Uh, that one is about uh, Egypt and the Exodus. The Ten Commandments is about that. Uh, Festival of Lights, Insights on the Holiday of Lights, Hanukkah, December time of the year. A Day of Atonement is the fourth one, and the fifth one is Perils of Profanity. And I'll be telling you a little bit more about the Perils of Profanity in today's show. Then there is also the four uh, Genesis Journeys programs. These are, each one is about two hours of audio teaching, along with a PDF study guide. And one of them is called Madam I'm Adam, Decoding Marriage Secrets from Eden, Second is Clash of Destiny, Decoding the Secrets of Israel and Islam. The third one is The Gathering Storm, and that's about the deteriorating social conditions that brought about Noah and his flood. And then Tower of Power, Decoding the Secrets of Babel. And here you see the origins of socialism. Right? Socialism didn't start recently. It didn't start on American universities. It didn't even start with the French Revolution. But it goes back much longer than that. And uh, it is a, a, a passionate drive for secularism that burns deep in man's heart. And that's all described in Tower of Power. We've also got the audio teaching on Boost Your Income. Uh, we've got another one on Prosperity Power, Connect for Success. We have another one on the Passover Seder. Why is the Passover Seder such a big deal? Three audio lessons and uh, along the Passover Haggadah. And then finally, the Ancient Jewish Wisdom DVD collection. It's three DVDs, um, each containing, I believe, four programs. I think it's about 12 half-hour programs of Susan Lappin and I teaching on video. And... Um, Anyway, we, we think it's terrific, and uh, people love it. So for all of those of you who would really like to um, connect with us on, on a deep and meaningful level, uh, please go to rabbidaniellappin.com and take a look at the details on the digital download library pack special sale. I think you'll find it extremely useful. Back to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show where I remind you that everybody needs a rabbi, right? Because who else would reveal for you how the world really works? Well, there was a considerable consternation um, on social media a few weeks ago uh, where uh, 
uh, Glenn Beck had mentioned that uh, I was his rabbi and everybody needs a rabbi. Um, and uh, and people, when I say people, I mean four or five people, but uh, there, you know, there were comments that went on into the hundreds. Uh, but some people got a little indignant at that, uh, insisting, why, why does Glenn need a rabbi? Or why does everybody need a rabbi? Or what's that about? Or um, for, for many devout Christians, the response was, I already have a rabbi, and uh, you know who his name is. But, um, and then, of course, a number of other people say, hey, calm down, calm down. Oh, there, was, there were a number of Jewish people who, who responded as well. You might, you might think that uh, your rabbi, that's me, has a little too much, on, uh, a little too much time on his hands to, to even be familiar with what's going on on social media. But so be it. Uh, I do keep a watch on it and uh, participate every now and then. But, uh, but yes, there were even some Jewish people who got extremely upset. Oh, it's very anti-Semitic to say that everybody needs a rabbi. It's stereotype. Oh, it's anti-Semitic. It's bigotry. Well, uh, one of the, uh, the recurring themes that I speak on when I speak in Jewish synagogues and congregations around the country, and I, it is true, I speak at far more churches than I do at synagogues. I probably speak at about, uh, I'm going to say about 10 10 synagogues, 10 or 12 synagogues a year. Uh, I speak at about 30 churches um, a year. And uh, uh, one of the themes that keeps recurring is that we Jews need thicker skin. We are so prickly and so quick to jump onto anything that we can possibly attribute to anti-Semitic bigotry. Stop it already. Gosh, not everybody's out to kill you. So... um, uh, and 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 I I wrote on that as well on on social media explaining that uh, uh, that I, I'm not in the least bit offended by the term because I initiated it. Um, it's been a catchphrase of mine for many years already, and obviously it's tongue in cheek. I mean, of course, not everybody needs a rabbi, but when I say everyone needs a rabbi, what I mean by that is that uh, in order to understand reality, to get a sense of how the world really works, uh, we do need to make sure that we use both our eyes, both our ears. In other words, we need to keep a focus on the physical material, and also we need to keep a focus on the spiritual. And by spiritual, I don't mean the pious, the religious, the godly, the divine. I don't mean that at all. Uh, Spiritual does not mean virtuous. Spiritual does not mean holy. Spiritual doesn't mean godly. Spiritual just means those important characteristics in human life that do not uh, lend themselves to measurement under physical circumstances, like in a laboratory or something like that. And so things like the length of an object or the weight of an object or the color of an object or the how loud a particular noise is, these are in fact uh, physical phenomena and are easily measured in a uh, physical environment, such as a laboratory. But so many of the other things that are vitally important in human life, such as love and loyalty and resilience and perseverance and so many other things, um, are spiritual in nature. And so uh, it is very important that uh, as we try and understand reality, that we fully understand the role that is played in our lives by spiritual objects. And I tend to say, although this is obviously not true, I say only a rabbi can tell you that. Well, I know far too many rabbis um, who know as much about spiritual things as the Marx brothers know about brain surgery. And uh, I know many people who are not rabbis who have a a very deep and full understanding of spiritual reality. So um, it's simply nothing other than a self-promotional, an obnoxiously self-promotional phrase that uh, that I I use. Everybody needs a rabbi. That's right. Uh, Because we're talking about, as we always do, the confluence of the spiritual and the physical. And nowhere is that more apparent than in the area of eating. And that's, of course, what we're talking about. But in order to be able to tell you a little bit more about that, I also have to just give you a little bit of a picture on uh, um, Sigmund Freud. (laughs) 
<laughs> What's that got to do with anything? Uh, well, this. Um, Freud is a guy who uh, was born Jewish. His dad was Jacob. Uh, he was a businessman. And... Um, and then uh, he he married uh, a, 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 another a lady. J Jacob Freud's father was brought up in in Judaism. Uh, his grandfather Freud's grandfather Jacob's dad was actually the person after whom Sigmund was named after. In Hebrew, uh, his Hebrew name his given Hebrew name was Shlomo, uh, which is the Hebrew for the English translation Solomon. And uh, whether Sigmund is the um, German translation of, of Solomon in any way at all, that I have no idea. And I, I, I made nothing more than a contemplative guess on the show a few um, episodes ago. Uh, I was speculating on whether, um, whether uh, Dostoevsky's first name Fedor was related in any way to Peter, and and one of the things I love about doing the show is how many of you contact me, how many of you stay in touch uh, through the Contact Us tab at our website. I'll tell you about that in a little while, and uh, and I and I love that because what happened is that uh, I got four very erudite responses from people explaining. Um, some explained the origin of Theodore, the difference between Peter, the connection with Theodore, and uh, and I learned a great deal from that. So I'm not uh, I'm not speculating now whether Sigmund is Solomon at all. I'm just telling you that he, when he was born, uh, he more than likely had a bris, a circumcision at eight days old, at which time uh, he was named more than likely. Um, however. Um, they born and grew up in Freiburg in Germany, and um, some time later, I think uh, I think Sigmund was already born. Jacob and his family moved um, to uh, they they had a stop off in Leipzig, and then they settled in Vienna. As soon as they got to Vienna, um, Jacob abandoned all religious tradition and basically severed his relationship with Judaism as a faith. And um, he became uh, connected at that point with the reform movement and uh, reform Judaism, okay? Uh, people joke about um, reform Judaism being the circumcised wing of the Democratic Party. And, uh, and that's, it's an unfair characterization because there are people who identify as reform Jews who are um, deeply religious, although usually not observant of Jewish tradition and law, um, and uh, you know, and there there are people who are not. But at any rate, in general, certainly in Vienna, in Austria, um, in the eighteen twenties and eighteen excuse me, uh, the nineteen uh, twenties and the nineteen thirties, there was certainly absolutely no no uh, religious association with, or let's say, Reform Judaism at that point um, had severed its connection with with uh, religion and with God and had tried and was trying to constitute a new form of Judaism based on uh, ethnic affiliation. And so, for instance, one of the things that we can find is that in prayer books of that era, and this is true for Germany as well as for Austria. And again, Germany and Austria were very closely connected. Um, large numbers of Austrians welcomed the Anschluss. They welcomed uh, when Hitler and his Nazis essentially took over Austria in a bloodless coup. And, uh, and in prayer books of that era in Germany, a reform, excuse me, just there was Orthodox Judaism alive and well in Germany and Austria at the time. But uh, as in the United States of America, the numbers are very different. The overwhelming majority of people uh, were reform affiliated. And uh, it's not at all an inaccurate statement uh, to say that for many people, reform Judaism was the last station on the train out of Judaism 
and for other people, often the first station on the journey, on the train journey into Judaism. Uh, and that's not a, an inaccurate depiction of what Reform Judaism is. But in prayer books of that era, uh, it was quite common to find that all references to Jerusalem, and again, Jerusalem shows up in uh, in in the Jewish prayer book and, and has for a very, very long period of time, and it shows up consistently. Uh, you know, you, you, you're you not going to turn too many pages in a Jewish prayer book, in an Orthodox Jewish prayer book, without finding the word Jerusalem. Well, interestingly enough, um, I actually, with my own eyes, have seen prayer books of the early 20th century from Germany and also from Austria, in which the word Jerusalem has been replaced with the word Berlin. Berlin, that's right, the city, the capital of Germany. Uh, or in some cases Vienna, and uh, and that's exactly what you know Jews used to say. We we are already, and it's hard to believe, right? Because the Holocaust had not yet happened. It was far away from anyone's imagination. Nobody could even dream of such a thing. In fact, even once it did begin happening, many many Jews in Germany uh, were, were were incapable of relating to this. It was like uh, the love affair that Ger that uh, Russians had with Stalin that uh, even when Russians were being executed on Stalin's direct orders, they insisted that, you know, if, uh, if, if only Stalin knew what was happening, he'd stop this when he was the one who actually caused it. So uh, interesting area of study, by the way, for, for people who are interested, how a, uh, a man like Stalin, and for that matter, Hitler also, but Stalin to, uh, to a greater extent, is able to perpetrate such limitless and monumental evil and retain the love and affection of the people whom he is tormenting. How many Russians lost their lives directly because of Stalin? Millions. But uh, for the most part, they continued loving him to the last day. And uh, and so uh, this this was the 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 reality in Germany and in 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 Austria before the war. Reform Jews uh, spoke about the Promised Land being Germany, uh, the the aspiration of Jewish dreams and and hopes was not Jerusalem but it was Berlin, and uh, and uh, and and so that became more and more the part of uh, the life. Eventually, uh, Freud's family abandoned all of that as well. I very much doubt that he had a bar mitzvah. Most likely not, because by then. Uh, the family was pretty dissociated from any religious observance. As a matter of fact, when uh, Jacob Freud married the woman who was going to become Sigmund's mother, uh, he refused to have a uh, Jewish ceremony. He wanted a civil marriage in the registrar, in, the government, or in a government office. He wanted absolutely nothing to do with the religious ceremony. Um, anyway, later on in uh, so Freud Freud was very di very disconnected and uh, but not only disconnected, actually hostile, and I'll explain that to you in just a moment. Uh, the Rabbi Daniel Lappin show you're listening to it, and I'm grateful to you for that. Um, I'd love for you to visit my website this week, and I'll tell you why because. Uh, because of what I'm talking about and the importance of some of the things, um, we actually have a 15% um, uh, discount on anything, on any of the resources that we carry in the store at rabbidaniellappin.com. Uh, there's a lot of information on uh, transforming your finances. Uh, there's a lot of information on transforming your family both relationships between spouses and between spouses and children. Uh, there's a lot of material on faith. There's a lot of material on understanding the development of socialism, liberalism, uh, communism. That's a product, by the way, called Tower of Power. And um, particularly in the context of the subject matter of today, uh, there's something called the perils of profanity. You are what you speak. Yeah, everybody needs a rabbi, and I humbly submit my candidacy to you for your consideration. <laughs> right. That'll start another firestorm of protest. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin, revealing how the world really works. And um, yes, uh, Sigmund Freud, uh, how relevant is his Jewishness 
to his psychiatry um, a great deal, far more than most people realize. Let me explain. Uh, I will say this, uh, not in any way to diminish the God-given brilliance that Sigmund Freud was blessed with, um, and not to say that absolutely everything he ever said was, was wrong, that that wouldn't be true. As a matter of fact, for those of you who actually do want to get a sense of the man, instead of reading about him, let his own words speak for him. Do you know what I mean? You know, and, and this is also true of in, in politics and in so many other areas where people will tell you all about the candidate or there will be articles about the candidate. Well, they're you know, either written by people who love him or people who hate him. And uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Why don't you just let the person speak for himself? And uh, Freud does that in um, a, a book sometimes published in one volume, sometimes in two volumes, called The Introductory Lectures. And I think there are 19 of them, if I remember correctly. I don't have the book right here in front of me, but I do have it on my shelves. And um, I think it's The Introductory Lectures in Psychiatry. And, and, and I, think, I think they're terrific. Uh, I, I've often said that uh, my only regret about time travel not being practical is that I cannot go back um, to Vienna and uh, sit in a, a lecture theater listening to Freud speaking. I wasn't able to do that, but um, soon after the uh, the Nazis took over uh, took over um, Austria, um, Sigmund Freud, uh, of course, was was regarded as Jewish, and uh, he. Um, wanted to get out and the British authorities intervened with the uh, uh, with the Germans and they actually got special permission for Freud and his family to escape um, Austria at that point. Uh, now a lot of smart people knew long before this that they needed to get out of there but uh, there were also smart people who thought that this was just a period of hooliganism in uh, the Hitlerian excesses of the Nazi party, that as soon as he'd got into power and as soon as he'd regularized things and got the disastrous economy uh, of Germany and, and Austria back into shape, that he'd settle down into normal Germanic uh, competent management and governing. They couldn't believe that the hooliganism uh, which they'd suffered, and again, you know, their, their children being molested on the streets, um, and I mean, uh, elderly Jewish men being accosted in the streets by Nazi hooligans and being forcibly held down while their beards were cut off and in some cases pulled off uh, painfully. And this was going long before the war started. All this was going on. Um, Jewish uh, shops and businesses being um, vandalized, um, uh, all kinds of things that were really shockingly horrible things. I mean, things that, you know, if, if, they, if they were happening in, uh, in American society today, most people would, would be horrified. I mean, if they were happening to, you know, Irish people or people with red hair or people with black skin or, you know, whatever it is. I mean, if there was a group of people being treated with this kind of brutality and you saw it in the streets, you know, most people wouldn't be able to take it. But uh, it happened gradually. It, 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 it grew and grew and grew, and uh, people were getting more and more accustomed to it. And, and as I say, people believed that it was not going to last and that they'd be okay. They'd eventually get out and everything would be fine. Anyway, Freud came to London, and, uh, and I will tell you this, that my father, uh, Rabbi A.H. Lappin, who was my, one of my most influential teachers, probably my most influential um, actually went to the Royal Albert Hall in London soon after Freud arrived in London and listened uh, to, a, to a, a lecture given by Sigmund Freud. So I envy that, but he, he, he told me about it as well. Anyway, with all that having been said, how significant was Freud's Jewishness? Very significant, because here's the funny thing about uh, we Jews. We are either absolutely dedicated and devoted to God and his Bible, or alternatively, for the most part, we are resentful, hostile, uh, rebellious, and, uh, and extremely negative. And so um, 
this is why it is that you know there are many many people who are not deeply committed or devout Christians, and neither are they hostile to Christianity. They're sort of indifferent to it. And wouldn't you agree that, that that's kind of the normal position to take? Hey, you know what? Um, I'm, I like trains. I love trains. I, I even, this, you know, this, I mean, who today likes playing with model railroads, right? Well, I don't have time to, but I've got my whole model train set. I mean, I've, I've literally got my whole model. I've got beautiful locomotives in the HO gauge. I've got all the rails. Um, I've got these switches. I even digitized my layout. I was a very early adopter of uh, digital control of model railroads. Who touches model railroads, right? I mean, it's hard to believe that, um, you know, that it's not that long ago. The world has changed so quickly that uh, people have lost interest in that. Anyway, my point is that people who are not interested in model railroads are indifferent to them, right? I could bore the pants off somebody just talking and talking and talking about model trains or full-size trains for that matter. That doesn't mean that those people hate it. They just don't love it like me. As, as a matter of fact, they'd wish I'd shut up about it because they could care less about model trains. Jews aren't like that with God and the Bible and religion. Jews are either for or against, with very few exceptions. As a matter of fact, I must tell you, it's, it's almost kind of refreshing for me to run into people who tell me they're Jewish and have no religious hang-ups at all. Uh, for the most part, we tend to be either committed to the Torah, committed to the Bible, committed to God, or alternatively, aggressively, strenuously, um, atheistic. And uh, there is a surprisingly large number of people who will tell you they are atheists and they're Jewish, which to my Christian friends sounds completely preposterous because you're either Christian or you're an atheist. You can't possibly be both. And I'm sure the same is true for most other religions. But Judaism is different. And uh, part of it is because Judaism uh, struggles, as it were, on a tightrope between religion and peoplehood. You know, so uh, Hebrews and Jews are referred to as a nation in the Bible, but it's also a faith. And it's not a nation such as, shall we say, the Swiss nation, where it's very difficult to become a Swiss. Um, anybody who wants to can become Jewish, you know. You can you can you can join. So on that basis, it's obviously a religion, but on several other bases outside the scope of this discussion, it's it's actually a people. And so part of the the sort of peoplehood of of Judaism has been a a very strong attempt to try and strip it of religion. And uh, one of the great cries of the early days of the uh, state of Israel, actually before the state of Israel, the early days of Zionism, uh, in the 1800s already, was that we've got to become a people like every other people, which when you think about it is exactly the warning that God gives to the Jews in the Bible, that if you do try and become like all the other people, then I have no more use for you. And so all of these kinds of tensions were roiling in trying to understand Sigmund Freud and um, and the development of psychiatry. He was, uh, his, his aggressive hostility and, uh, and very uh, ardent hatred of religion in general, Judaism in particular, obviously stemmed from Judaism. And um, he then um, spent his later years uh, writing The Making of an Illusion, uh, which is one of his books on um, on uh, essentially <laughs> the, you know, the, the destruction of religion. Um, and so... Uh, there is no way that you can understand uh, not only Freud's central concepts, but even the entire uh, uh, origins of the psychoanalytic movement without understanding the Jewish connection. Uh, and again, many people used to protest in the early part of the 20th century, you know, psychoanalysis and psychiatry. These are not Jewish topics, but, but the fact is they were. Um, a very high proportion then as now, by the way, of psychiatrists uh, were Jewish. They really were. And so why was that? What was really going on? Well, what was happening was that um, up till that point, approximately, it was well understood that we have a body and that we have a soul. Uh, 
that our lives are driven by physical factors as well as by spiritual factors, as you've heard me speak about quite often. And it used to be generally understood. Today, I could speak in many circles in the United States of America along these lines and, uh, and be uh, uh, lynched out of the auditorium with, uh, with uh, rotten tomatoes being flung at my departing figure because the idea that there is a soul connected to our body would be viewed by many in America today as, as completely primitive and, and nonsensical and, and really something that needs to be stripped from the thinking of any educated, sophisticated, modern intellectual. But it didn't always used to be that way. And uh, it was understood really all the way up into the 19th century, it was understood that we were uh, bodies and souls. And that in the same way that there are things that can go wrong with your body, there are also things that can go wrong with your soul. When things go wrong with your body, you need a body doctor. When things go wrong with your soul, you need a soul doctor, or in other words, a rabbi, or a priest, or a pastor. And surely, one of the most significant functions that was carried out by religious leaders back then as now was uh, spiritual counseling helping people solve problems. Now, these problems are very serious because there is such a thing as a psychosomatic disease. There is a disease which is entirely spiritual in nature and manifests itself physically. And uh, I've told you in an earlier podcast, I've told you about a, a, a case after World War II in which my father was involved, uh, where a psychosomatic disorder, where something that happened spiritually caused the actual paralysis of a gentleman's arm and how my father as a clergyman, as a religious leader, uh, was able to cure him in a way that uh, uh, medical specialists you know, were simply, I mean, neurologists were in on it, uh, orthopedic people were in on it, uh, every kind of doctor was in on it. But Doctors were trained and are trained today to be strictly materialistic, to only look at the physical. Big mistake, of course, by the way. Different topic, another conversation. But that is part of medicine today. And, um, and psychiatrists are, well, before I get to that, uh, the spiritual side is not usually a part of the training or the practice or the experience of most doctors, understandably. Especially specialists have to specialize and get that. Uh, but uh, these, this realization that holistic health is a reality, that the health of your soul can very often impact the health of your body, uh, more so that way than the other way. In other words, there are people who have uh, horrible physical health conditions and suffer terribly physically, but who spiritually are beacons of light. The other way is very rare. You very, very seldom find somebody who is in very bad shape spiritually and whose body is, oh, just fantastic and terrific. You find it. It is there. Less so than the other way around. Point being that Freud's uh, commitment, Freud's entire life was we've got to find a way to deal with the non-physical side of the human being without touching religion. This single sentence I've just said is the full depiction of understanding the motivation and the life and the entire career of the late Sigmund Freud. And that's why at the climax of his life, he was writing books like uh, Moses and Monotheism and, um, and books like uh, The Making of an Illusion. And in, in Moses and Monotheism, I mean, it's really important to understand that, like, really, we're talking about very, very, very wacky, crazy stuff. Um, you know, really, I mean, it's just so strange. Um, he spoke about, he, he basically redid the whole Moses story. It's as if the Bible didn't exist for him. But, and it was weird, and this is the specific Jewish ambivalence I've been talking about, that you can't be indifferent to the Bible, but neither can you accept it. And so you're resentful of something you don't believe in. I mean, that's the weird thing, which just goes to show that deep in the heart, deep down in the Jewish soul, there must be this conviction that uh, 
you know, God and his word are there and are true. And um, that uh, today anybody reading uh, the uh, Moses and monotheism, which is, I mean, absolutely not recommended. It's it's complete garbage. Um, the the central argument of the book is that Moses was really an Egyptian, and that monotheism originated in Egypt, and that Moses was actually murdered by the Jews. Um, it's so fanciful and so insane that um, it it embarrassed supporters of Freud when he wrote it. He, the people who had bought into his theories of psychoanalysis uh, were embarrassed by it because it was indefensible on any uh, intellectually valid level. Anyway, what, what was it all about? Uh, he was determined to find a way of this is the central theme. I mean, you want, you want to know what Freud's all about. His life was devoted to finding a way to explaining the spiritual without resorting to God or religion. Certainly not the Bible. So he couldn't help acknowledging the fact that there are parts, very important parts of the human being that are non-physical, right? In a way that isn't true for cows and cats and camels and kangaroos. You look at animals, the physical is the physical, right? In spite of the fact that on New York's Upper East Side, there are a few people who make a living as animal psychologists. All right, spare me. But uh, I, I just I put that in because I know that some of you are going to write and tell me about it. I know about it. It doesn't change the argument. It's it's, it's complete nonsense. Uh, the idea, you just have a, you need a veterinary surgeon, you're right? For any animal, if an animal has a problem, you get a veterinary surgeon, animal gets cured, end of story. You don't, the animal, you know, the veterinary surgeon, and never says, well, there's nothing wrong with him physically, but he's suffering, his, his psyche is right, it's complete rubbish. With human beings, Freud couldn't escape the obvious reality that uh, with people, there is such a thing as an, an inner uh, spiritual aspect, and Freud's determination was to find a way of dealing with that without touching on religion. And so it was essentially the beginning of the, uh, the field of psychiatry, which essentially um, turns everything into an organic problem. You got you you're depressed, you need tablets. Uh, you have a mood problem. Well, we have a psychotropic drug for drug for you. And so, never tackling the underlying spiritual anxieties, which usually will have something to do with a failed connection with our Creator. Uh, the result is, and again, you know, you can go through life curing symptoms and not dealing with the underlying problem. Uh, you can you can do that with on the physical side as well. It's just sad and uh, and and um, and and an inadequate way of dealing with things on that basis. Anyway, all of that um, is going to be useful as I move on to show you how it is that um, food has a spiritual dimension. Something that uh, may be shocking to you, may be completely new, and that's why I want to make certain that I, I give you enough of a background so as you can see not only where this is going, but where it came from as well. Uh, the materials, as I've, I've said, a lot of the materials on which I'm basing much of what I'm telling you in this program um, can be found in full on my website at the store. And uh, you would be helping yourself as well as my work uh, by equipping yourself with that. In other words, many people write to me and, and have a heart, folks. People email me sometimes with long, complicated questions based on um, angles or based on issues or topics that I raise in the show. And these are things I answer in my books, they are things I answer in my audio programs. They're there, and it, it would for me to answer that email would be uh, a lengthy proposition. And I'm sure you understand. I can't do that. My answers, those of you who get answers from me, and and many of you have, you'll see they're brief. I write an answer of four or five lines max, and and that's it. And th that's the choice. I mean, I I obviously can't do more than that, and. Uh, and so that's why I say, you know, if you do have further questions, I really want you to go to uh, rabbidaniellappin.com and uh, check out the store there, particularly because this week, the, the week you're, you're listening to this show, I, if you're listening on time, um, the week of the release of this show, it, it, everything there is on sale, 15% off everything. You just have to type in the code, the promotional code SAVE, S-A-V-E, 
as part of the checkout process. And um, and so if, if there are areas that, that you want to probe a little more deeply and, uh, and get in a little more, uh, listen, don't ask me about those things in, in an email. It's not reasonable. I can't possibly respond. Uh, it is there. It's, it's there and it's inexpensive and it's available and it is of enormous, enormous value. Um, just recently, I was talking to uh, a young man and uh, an issue, uh, he, he was consulting with me personally on, um, uh, on a marriage matter. And I explained something about that, and I said to him, I just want to tell you, this uh, This is a million-dollar idea I'm telling you. He said, you know, what do you mean? I said that over the years, uh, teaching this particular idea, both in marriage uh, programs and particularly in business programs, have made me the recipient of over a million dollars of uh, funds. In Sometimes it's by way of... Uh, um, grateful gifts. Sometimes it's by way of uh, negotiated fees. But whatever it is, the value of this material to people obviously has exceeded a million dollars. Otherwise, they wouldn't have given me that money. They wouldn't have voluntarily parted with that money over the years uh, if they didn't feel they were getting something of greater value. That's the point. Uh, ancient Jewish wisdom has real value in changing people's lives. So uh, that's why I, I uh, feel nothing but enthusiasm for telling you about it and, and enthusiasm encouraging you if you have a need for it. If you don't, obviously, you'd be silly to do it. But if you have a need or an interest, then it would be uh, simply reckless not to to engage. So head over there, rabbidaniellappin.com, and uh, head to the store. And uh, moving on with our overall discussion of uh, food, overeating, and providing you with what I believe to be perhaps the only legitimate, reliable, and effective way of losing weight. And uh, in order to do that, obviously, you need to understand not only the physical aspects of eating, but also the spiritual aspects of eating. And that's why it is that uh, I explained earlier on a whole lot about Sigmund Freud, because um, in many ways, his influence, and his influence has been extensive, uh, I, I would say that in the great debate uh, of the, that period, the great debate between the two psychiatry, psychi fathers of psychiatry, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, uh, where, first of all, what they argued about and what ultimately ended their friendship, again, not because of Carl Jung, but because of Sigmund Freud, which is that Jews who are atheistic cannot be friendly with Jews who are religious. It's one of the reasons that there is a considerable tension, less so today than previously for very interesting reasons, but there used to be considerable tension between Jews in Israel, between religious, God-fearing, Bible-believing Jews on the one hand, and um, Israelis, people who were Jewish, born in Israel, and were subjected to a religion-free education. Uh, it's not as if they could be a live and let live. It doesn't work that way with us Jews. And, uh, and so, sure enough, um, when Sigmund Freud realized that his colleague, Carl Jung, was deeply religious and saw the soul for what it was, the essential, most important part in a human being, and that it's much more the soul that governs the body than that it's the body that governs the soul, although... Uh, there are aspects of it that do. For instance, when you see people who, who live completely depraved and degenerate lives and then becoming dissolute in not only in body but in physical appearance and in soul as well, that's one of the ways that body does impact the soul. So I'm not saying it doesn't, but it's, it's far more the soul that impacts the body. Uh, Freud couldn't tolerate it and ended the relationship, ended the friendship, all gone. Because Jews who are atheistic are not just indifferent to Jews or anybody who is religious. I should say anybody. I shouldn't have said Jews. Jews who are atheistic are not just indifferent to Jews who are religious or to anybody who's religious. They get very worked up. They get agitated. Sitting in the same... I'm not exaggerating. I understand this. It's... Uh, 
I'm a rabbi. I've lived through this. I, I know this sounds completely weird. I'm, I'm thinking of how this sounds to uh, a Christian listener, how this sounds to an atheistic listener. And I mean, I know many, many non-Jewish atheists. I do. Um, and I think very highly of some of them. And, uh, and they're completely fine. They're fine with, with uh, Orthodox Jews. But Jewish atheists are not at all fine with believing Jews or believing Christians. Okay, it's, it's really important to get that. And so, um, because uh, Freud won over Carl Jung, uh, today psychiatry in the United States of America is far more Freudian than it is Jungian. Um, and, and I've told people, in general, all things being equal, and again, I, I don't give advice um, to for specific cases over the air on radio or television or or anywhere like that but in general all things being equal if i had to consult a psychiatrist i would seek out a jungian psychiatrist not a freudian psychiatrist but it would be hard because freud won jung lost and as a result of that uh, the world today both in medicine and psychiatry is now seen just as a part of medicine it's all physical everything can be resolved on a chemical level everything can be by be sorted out by physical therapy or by um, a drug of one kind or another the notion that your relationship with god could be impacting could be impacting a physical problem you have like your weight um, is completely rejected by, shall we call it, the medical mainstream or the mainstream medical world, the MSM. Um, completely rejected, and I, and I understand that, and, and you need to understand that as well. But uh, And by the way, also don't think that just because somebody says he's an atheist that uh, that he doesn't have some connection with God. He may phrase, not everybody, not all, I mean, some atheists are solid. But many atheists um, are have a relationship. They prefer think of it as some kind of being, or they sometimes paganistically think of it as being nature or the world. Uh, it's fascinating talking to thoughtful and open-minded atheists. I enjoy that, but I don't believe I know any open and open-minded and thoughtful Jewish atheists. I, I'm going to put a, a pause on that particular thought because um, I haven't really thought about it. It's, it's it sort of sounds a little bit. Um, excessive, doesn't it, to say that I've never met a thoughtful Jewish atheist, open-minded. It sounds it sounds too far-fetched, so I'm going to take that back and say there probably have been over the years, but whereas I can easily think of people I'm in touch with who are thoughtful uh, non-Jewish atheists, uh, offhand I'm having trouble thinking of a thoughtful, open-minded Jewish atheist. This is just part of just what's what makes us Jews different. I'm sorry, we just are. As much as we try to to fit in and we try to be the same as everyone else, doesn't quite work. And so, uh, understand then that uh, that there is an aspect to eating which is profoundly spiritual and God centric. Let me explain. I said I was going to talk about a toilet, and what am I talking about? Nothing scatological. Nothing. Uh, you have to send uh, young people out of the room for. But um, you know that toilet cistern behind the place you sit at? Um, it's, uh, it's where the, the, the chrome handle comes out of it to flush. Now, some of the new ones, and again, why on earth government has to be involved in how many gallons of water I want to pay for? To And I, I pay for my water, right? I presume you do too. Uh, I'm not allowed to elect how much money I want to spend on flushing. The government tells me I have to use low flush toilets, and they have all kinds of mechanisms in there. But, but you know, I remember when uh, when when we we didn't we didn't build a house. We we did major renovations on a house twice. I actually went to junkyards. I went to uh, I, I sought out places, and even had somebody drive me one from Canada. Uh, to seeking out older toilets, I like a full flush toilet. I'm sorry, I don't. I just, I there, there is something significant about being able to move your bodily waste off your premises quickly and easily. This is a fundamental part of Western civilization, and I don't like having the government deprive me of that right. I'm willing to pay for it. I do pay for it, 
uh, I'll decide how much water I want to use. I say all this because I'm going to recommend that uh, you take a look inside your cistern if you don't know what I'm talking about. And if it, you don't see what I'm describing, that would be because you have a, a new type of toilet that substitutes all kinds of dreamy ideas of water pressure uh, replacing actual water. They don't work. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. You have to flush two or three times to get the same effect that a simple five gallons would have given you in the first place. And so what you see is that water comes from the water pipe, comes pouring into the cistern. And uh, while it's doing that, a ball on the end of an arm rises because the ball is hollow. It floats. It might be made of foam. The old ones used to be beautiful things made out of copper. Uh, hard to get these days, but I got one. And... Uh, you uh, you watch as the water level rises, and you can even see a mark on the side of the cistern because the water has, has been coming up to that level for years, and it's left uh, the mineral in the water has left a mark. As it begins to approach, you can hear the ball rising, and you can hear the arm operating a valve that is gradually turning off the water until finally the water reaches its level, and at that point the floating arm uh, has turned off the water, and that's the end of it, right? No no more water. No more water coming in. You've now got a cistern. As soon as you flush, the water drops through the flap valve at the bottom. The ball drops, and that opens the valve. More water comes in. Okay, now, I tell you all of that because I want you to imagine the water filling two cisterns simultaneously. So the water comes in on a Y valve, and it's filling cistern A, and it's filling cistern B, but only a has the ball valve, okay? And the way they figured it is that the same amount of water is going into both cisterns. By the way, this, this is not real. You won't find this in your bathroom. This is a, a, a thought experiment. So the same amount of water is split by the Y valve, same amount of water going each of the two cisterns. They thought, why uh, make two separate valves? We'll just put one valve before the Y valve, uh, before the Y uh, um, distributor, and uh, as the water level rises in cistern A, it'll cut off the water flow at the right point, and by that point, the water level will be uh, up in cistern B as well. Now, let's imagine that uh, somebody drills a hole in cistern A, where the ball valve is, and now the water pours in, but it also pours out. And it never gets to the point where it raises the floating ball and turns off the ball valve. So now what happens to cistern B? Cistern B goes ahead and overflows. You follow my situation? Cistern A has the ball valve and a bad hole that somebody drilled in it. Cistern B just overflows because the water never gets turned off. All right? Okay, cistern A is a spiritual cistern, if you like. Spiritual A is the spiritual satisfaction that food provides. Spiritual cistern B is the physical part of your tummy. And so what happens? Somebody has made drilled a hole in cistern A. Somebody's made it impossible for you to feel spiritually fulfilled from food. And therefore, what happens? The food keeps on pouring in because the turnoff valve, which is operated by the spiritual part of our beings, never operates. And so it keeps filling cistern B until when? Until your belly bulges. Until you've got thighs like oak trees until you are so big and so heavy you can barely move. I mean, it's it's not joke-worthy. It's, it's sad and tragic. But this, what is going on? My friends, here's the most important thing to understand, that eating provides a feeling of physical fill, fullness, but it also provides spiritual fulfillment. And if something is interfering with a spiritual fulfillment, you keep on eating because... We all eat to satiation, but satiation is caused spiritually. And if something is wrong, and with that part of the ball valve not working, the spiritual side not ever filling up, you just keep eating. Way beyond, way beyond anything your body actually needs. And for that matter, anything beyond what your body actually wants. 
and this is what unfortunately Sigmund Freud destroyed the understanding of in society we eat not only to be filled but also to be fulfilled food provides fill and fulfill that's the key thing to understand and uh, I want to uh, again uh, remind you and you you know you'll pardon me but uh, but there is a, uh, a a valid business aspect here which is that when a business is providing a an important and needed service or a needed goods um, they they'd be stupid not to tell you about it and you'd be stupid to block your mind from it this is one of the reasons that we don't mind advertisements of a certain kind we really don't if they are telling us about things that can improve our lives you know we're we're smart enough we can know what to buy and what not to buy it's one of the reasons that people who are secularists um, attack advertising exploitative it, it forces people that's a view of people that is patronizing and elitist the idea that advertising is so all-powerful that I cannot defeat it I cannot resist it that's an elitist patronizing secularistic view of humanity um, I uh, I don't see it that way I believe that uh, those of you who have no need for the products and resources that I create and market uh, will know not to avail themselves of it I mean that's all I mean, I'm not a Svengali I'm not a hypnotist uh, all I have to do is tell you it exists and in this case I tell you it not only exists but this week it's at a 15 percent discount so now you can make a different sort of calculation it might not have been worth it to you at um, you know at, at fifty dollars but at fifteen percent off at forty two dollars and fifty cents it might be worth it to you every one of us makes our own calculations of how to utilize our financial resources that having been said rabbi daniel lappin dot com head over to the store on that website and know that this week use the uh, promo code SAVE save and uh, in fact save 15% so um, back with you then in a in a moment as we now take a look at what the spiritual fulfillment of food is and what you can do in order to enhance that as as best you possibly can uh, in order to have your entirety your body and your soul send a ball valve message stop eating you're full instead of which when that's defective when that's defective we carry on eating in this desperate hope that by stuffing ourselves with food we're going to reach a point where we actually feel satiated you won't because satiation comes the feeling of satiation comes from the spiritual side of our beings not from the physical and as we continue exploring uh, how peculiar it is that human beings have one organ for communicating and also for absorbing nourishment isn't that odd wouldn't you have thought that there'd be specialization for instance you know we don't use our eyes for seeing and smelling right there is specialization of organ use and whether you prefer to view the world as a product of random long-term materialistic evolution or if you prefer to view it as the concretized will of an all-powerful creator either way either way you really have a question mark now if you prefer the former approach then the question mark is what possible evolutionary purpose is served by having the mouth serve both communication and eating if anything it's negative because if you're in the middle of eating and trying to swallow and danger shows up on the horizon you have no way of communicating that to the person you're with because your mouth is engaged in eating but if you had another orifice in the middle of your forehead that was used for communicating and your mouth was just used for absorbing nourishment from the world it, it would work better and if you take the approach that we are here because a creator created us in his image then we have to ask ourselves um, what is it 
that the good Lord wanted us to understand from giving us one organ to do both these functions? Well, the, uh, the verse that is of interest, and again here, this part won't be interesting to those of you who are not uh, Bible enthusiasts, but that's fine. Uh, you know, the fact is that the, the book, regardless of what you think of it, has been the most significant volume in the shaping of Western civilization. And so uh, um, no harm if I tell you that um, in the, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, we have a, a verse that's sort of very relevant to all of this. And um, Ecclesiastes chapter 6 says the following. Would you like to hear it in the Hebrew? I mean, I know that very few of you know the Hebrew or read the Hebrew, and that's fine, but it has a certain uh, resonance to it and a, a certain music to it, I think. And that is, um, in Hebrew it says, Kol amal ha'adam lefihu v'gam ha'nefesh lo timale. And that means that uh, all a person, if a person works and labors only for the purpose of his mouth, then his soul will never be satiated. Okay, in other words, uh, all the, the labor that a person does, if it's only for his mouth, in other words, he, the entire aspect of his life is just to be able to feed his mouth. When you think about it, obviously, that's the most basic a survival function of the human being. No eat, no live. It's as simple as that. And so if, um, now again, you know, we have built up an infrastructure. Uh, you like your car? Well, its main purpose is to get to work so you can work and get paid so you can eat. Um, you know, you like your television set? Uh, well, that's one of the, the functions of uh, being able to expand your your appetite in a sense. Um, and it's it's part of what you uh, have rewarded yourself with, um, regardless of whether that's a good idea or not. But uh, says uh, Ecclesiastes chapter six verse seven: uh, If all your work is for your mouth, then the soul will never be satiated. And that is one of the paramount verses from which ancient Jewish wisdom understands everything I'm explaining to you. And uh, I'll lay this out in much greater detail in a new resource I will soon have available on the store at my website, rabbidaniellappin.com, uh, where all of this will be presented in greater depth along with the various exercises and programs. But for practical usage, I'm going to give you enough right here in this program now that will enable you to begin employing some of these things uh, in order to live healthier and lose weight. In, in the only way that really works. Uh, so, as I said, the key to it is understanding that uh, if you leave the spiritual side out of it and all you're doing is eating to feed your mouth, you'll never be satisfied, which I've already explained. Now, uh, the, um, the, 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 the fact that the mouth serves this double duty, as I've, I've spoken about, is, is very interesting because I... Uh, I, I have wonderful experiences through broadcasting, and talk radio is, is great. And while I was broadcasting on KSFO uh, out of San Francisco, um, which was, it was a great station, I was there for a number of years, and I really enjoyed it. And, um, and one of the things that happened was that uh, I was talking a little bit about uh, the dangers of speaking uh, carelessly, using your mouth carelessly. And I get a phone call. And it's a guy driving back in the car from camping in Lake Tahoe, right, California, border of California, Nevada. And um, he had two young guys in the car. One was his son. One was a friend of his son. So he had taken these two boys camping. And, and uh, it sounds like they had a great time. They're driving back. And on the way back, they got the, the radio on. And the boys had a, pr a station they wanted to hear. And at one point, um, they... I guess something came on the station they weren't interested in. So one of the boys gave him a CD to pop into the uh, player in the car. He pops it in, and out comes the obscene lyrics of a rap song. Um, lyrics, the guy says to me, uh, look, I would have been embarrassed even if the boys were, in, were not in the car. But having my son and his friend in the car, this was, it was intolerable. Um, it, it, I, I didn't want them to know that I, I could hear that sort of stuff. 
And he said, I didn't want to hear it. So they, he turns it off and he says that um, uh, they, the boys say, uh, okay, you know, like what's happening? He says, listen, guys, I don't want you to hear these obscenities. I don't want you listening to that vile language. And I'll tell you something else. I don't want to hear it myself. What's more, I wish somebody had told me when I was your age to never listen to this stuff. And um, one of the boys, and this is all the father's explaining to me what's just happened. The boys are in the car. And, uh, and then he says, and one of the boys says, why not? What's wrong with it? And he says, at that point, I dialed you up. I, I knew you were on the air at this time. I flipped the radio to, uh, to, to your station, and um, I'm now calling in. So uh, I thought, okay, this is, this is very interesting. And by the way, what I told him then was the genesis of the uh, audio program I've been telling you about called The Perils of Profanity, um, the You Are What You Speak. And I explained that uh, that there are very good reasons, you know, and you don't have to fall back on it makes God mad or anything like that. Uh, there are very good reasons why using obscenities and profanities are really destructive. They're destructive for your business life. They damage your ability to communicate. And on my program, The Perils of Profanity, I explain it, it in full detail, obviously, to him, um, you know, it, because there was a limit to how much you can cover in a conversation on talk radio, I, I wasn't able to go into the whole thing, but uh, at least I did enough so as w that when I said, tell me, do the boys in the car, if, if they can hear me uh, or ask them, I want to know, are they able to at least begin to see that this is not because you're just an old fuddy-duddy or that you're not with it, but this is actually harmful. And he, he spoke to them, and, the, and I heard him, everybody say, uh, it's given us something to think about, which is as much as I could hope to do under those circumstances. But since then, I have put the entire lesson, all the teaching on the, uh, the damage you can do by allowing your mouth to become familiar with expressing obscenities and so on. I put it on the, uh, the program. Uh, perils of profanity and by the way i want you to go take a look at that at the website rabbi daniel lappin dot com and you should know that uh, it's very inexpensive to begin with but uh, there's a 15 percent discount as i've told you on the show uh, this week so um, just put in during checkout put in the code save s-a-v-e to be able to activate that on that product or anything else that i've produced um, this is the week of passover and uh, Passover is very much connected with this whole topic. Why? What am I saying? Well, the, the holiday of Passover is, uh, is very interesting because in Hebrew it's called Pesach, which, as you can hear, sounds a little bit like uh, other languages, whereas Pascal, you know, you hear that P-S-C or P-S-C-H sound taking out the vowels, as I've explained. Uh, well, the word Pesach, or the word uh, for Passover, it doesn't actually mean Passover in Hebrew just by itself. It actually means talking mouth. Talking mouth, that's right. And what's more, the Exodus takes place. It says if the, the redemption from slavery transports them into a desert, that's where they go. They leave Egypt and they go into the desert, the Sinai Desert. Um, what is the desert in Hebrew? It's called a midbar or a midaber. In Hebrew, that means a place of speech. So it says if part of being enslaved was not communicating, having their ability to communicate deprived, and they move out into the desert, and the very first place they come to in the desert, uh, mentioned in, um, in Exodus, um, is, of course, uh, it's called pi hachirot in Hebrew. Uh, that's mentioned in Exodus chapter 14, verse 2, and it's mentioned in Numbers chapter 33, verse 7. Uh, what does Piachirot mean? It's not just a place name. In Hebrew, that means the mouth of freedom. And so redemption from troubles of almost any kind depend upon effective communication. And so the only time during the entire Jewish calendar year with all the festivals, the only time you actually need your mouth is on Passover, because you have to do a speaking. The Passover Seder is all about speaking. But wait, it's not only all about speaking, it's also all about eating. 
And that's very interesting because the only time you are obliged to eat is on Passover, where you have to eat matzah. It's that dry, indigestible, unleavened cracker uh, called matzah. And, um, and you can see it in almost any market in the country this time of the year. Uh, it's, um, you have to eat it. And what's more, we have to eat bitter herbs. So when we sit at our Seder, uh, which we did on, on Friday night and on Saturday night, uh, what happens is that, speaking just about uh, the year 2016, of course, but other years it's on different days, uh, we are uh, obliged to eat certain things. So there's a lot of focus on the mouth here. The idea is that uh, the mouth is for eating and communicating. And in the same way that the mouth can be used correctly for what goes out of it, and it can be used incorrectly for, what's go, for what goes out of it, one can be very destructive to one's life by using our mouth incorrectly, okay? In the same way, using it incorrectly for speech has a parallel, using it incorrectly as a uh, portal for nourishment and nurturing. And so, for instance, the book of Proverbs has numerous references very, very similar to this. I'll just give you one, uh, because, again, this, uh, the, the essence of the show is how the world really works, exposing you to ancient Jewish wisdom. And uh, biblical verses is like taking you into my workshop. Um, and I don't really want to do that. I want you to stay out front and you'll see in the store, you'll see all the, 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 the products. But my woodworking craftsmanship takes place in the shop behind the store. And uh, that's where all the biblical verses are. But the biblical verse I'm talking about is one who guards his mouth and his tongue guards himself from troubles. One who guards his mouth and his tongue. Well, wait a sec. Ancient Jewish wisdom points out that there are no redundancies in Scripture. Could have said, he who guards his mouth saves himself from trouble in life, which is what the verse says. And we'd understand that to mean that um, um, that he, he doesn't use his mouth badly in, in speaking. But one who guards his mouth and his tongue, we now got a problem. There's a redundancy. And ancient Jewish wisdom explains here as elsewhere that the mouth is an organ used for two things. And King Solomon in the book of Proverbs is pointing that out right here. Um, you can use your tongue incorrectly for speech and you can use your mouth incorrectly for eating. Use your tongue incorrectly. You could be slandering and gossiping. You could be using profanities and obscenities that destroy your ability to communicate. Uh, you could just be... Uh, inarticulate, non-eloquent, and leave it at that, not take seriously your obligation to work on your communicative abilities. All of those things are bad for your life. In the same way, uh, one can make mistakes with our eating, with the, with the mouth, not the tongue. How, what happens there? Well, what happens there is uh, we become bloated and uh, fat. I mean, that's what happens there. We're using our mouth badly. It's, it's very, very simple. And uh, think about, again, a parallelism, a sort of um, very nice symmetry in understanding this interesting organ, uh, the mouth, putting out, and we're communicating, putting in, and we're nurturing the body. Well, think about that for, for a second. What is speech actually? Isn't speech the mechanism by means of which the human being can bring ideas into the physical reality? Right? In other words, if you've got a business plan, if you cannot express that to your partner or to your investor or to your friends, if you can't express that, then no business will ever come out of that business plan. You first got to be able to communicate it, and then afterwards you might write it down. But speech is the beginning. Uh, and so the word is what converts abstract into reality and into practical. Or if you like, the spiritual gets converted into the physical by means of speech, using the mouth in that fashion. What about when you use the mouth for ingesting nourishment? Well, now you're doing the opposite. You're taking physical and converting it to spiritual. Why? Because a human being is primarily a spiritual reality. And so when we take food, we're taking something that is materialistic and, and physical in the world, absorbing it into our body, and now 
that becomes a spiritual part of, or part of our spiritual existence. Our whole ability to eat and breathe and talk depends on that food we brought in. So the mouth, when it's in mode one, namely speech, is taking the spiritual and converting it into the physical. When mouth is in mode two, namely eating, now you're taking the physical and converting it into the spiritual. And uh, what can we do with all of these ideas? Well, I'm sure you're beginning to see the picture emerging. I point out that there are two ways that I can think of of showing you the spirituality of eating. Uh, well, one of them, of course, is unfortunately the whole area of eating disorder. Uh, anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, all of these food disorders all coexist. When they present, it's almost always with depression, substance abuse, anxiety disorders. Uh, as a matter of fact, the highest mortality rate of any um, psychiatric disorder are the, food, the eating disorders. They are really serious. And uh, everybody recognizes that for repairing, helping somebody with an eating disorder, you don't go to a doctor to get a shot. You have to go to a psychiatrist. Again, thank you, Sigmund Freud. But um, the truth is that in a Bible-believing religious uh, communities, more often than not, uh, eating disorders are very rare. And when they do occur, they're quickly solved spiritually almost always okay it's a uh, you know obviously difficult difficult area but who would have thought that food is mental me i would have thought that because i know ancient jewish wisdom and now you do too and so it's no surprise that eating disorders are psychiatric or spiritual as we should really more accurately think of it and uh, Another aspect of it is that throughout the Torah, throughout all of Jewish life, it is very clear that no spiritually significant event or occasion takes place without eating. You know, from which you get the, um, you know, the old joke they say that uh, the way to celebrate any Jewish holiday is to simply make the statement, um, they try to kill us, God saved us, let's have dinner. Because everybody knows that Jews celebrate by eating. But that's not just for a party. That's because the act of eating, when done properly, is spiritual. And when the act of eating is done properly, and it becomes a spiritual action, then it becomes fulfilling long before it becomes filling. In other words, you can quit eating in time. And so instead of thinking that overweight, overeating, is simply a result of lack of willpower, no self-control, realize that there's a lot more to it. And that is that there is a spiritual dimension and that the person who's eating so much is eating in order to be spiritually filled. But you'll remember the toilet cistern example. All that, uh, that spiritual energy is running away to waste because the person is not aware of it. And so he keeps on eating and eating and eating in, in a desperate desire and attempt to reach a point of feeling satisfied, harmonious, totality, shalem in Hebrew, to just feel complete. And he can't because that spiritual dimension is still missing, and so he eats more in the hope of getting it. But you can eat endlessly, and if you don't know how to absorb the spiritual dimension into your soul, it's not going to do anything for you, and therefore you continue eating naturally. So, uh, so whether it is uh, uh, Jewish holidays, Passover is a conspicuous one, of course, where, where the eating is, is absolutely required and mandated because of the relationship between eating and speaking. Um, so it is with, with all other Jewish holidays, there is a meal. How about weddings? A wedding isn't complete until there's been a wedding meal. That's, and it's called that, the official ceremonial wedding meal. And people sit down and eat the meal together with the bride and the groom, and there are special marital blessings that are said then. 
Um, how about a circumcision? Baby boy given a circumcision and given his name on the eighth day after birth, that requires a meal following it. Even the most solemn and holiest day of the year, which is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, even that day, which is a fast day, it's the most solemn fast day of the year, even that day requires that just before sunset, just before the fast begins, one actually has to have a formal celebratory holiday meal because we accept we're not allowed to eat on the Day of Atonement, but you can't possibly have a spiritually significant day like Yom Kippur, like the Day of Atonement, without eating. And so the eating just before sunset constitutes the actual eating for the day itself. That's the idea. And so we, we, we wrap ourselves around this, this, this uh, principle that eating and spirituality go together. And one of the ways we alert ourselves to that is by doing a grace, saying a blessing before the meal. Right? Uh, although in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 10, it says, and you shall eat and be satisfied and uh, bless the Lord, um, that's talking about, once again, eating physically and being satisfied spiritually and then bless the Lord. But you also have to say a grace before the meal. What's the idea? And again, for, for those of you who are not religious and, uh, and are not biblically or, or, or godly-centric in your lives, that's fine. I was going to say, that's fine. Don't worry. It's all, it's all good. Um, no, I mean, I'm, I'm saying it's a little harder for you, but it doesn't mean you cannot benefit from this principle either. In other words, diving into a meal when you're hungry is a big mistake. You're going to eat more than you should. What you've got to do is you've got to pause and you've got to have a little bit of a ceremonial spiritual moment. Now, I do it by saying a special blessing before I eat. I'm sure many of you do the same. But the truth is that if there's any way at all that you can sit down to the meal and not tuck your napkin in, slap your tummy and say, I can't wait to dive into this, that's destructive. If you can pause and, and take 30 seconds on a, uh, a spiritual moment, that sets you in the right mood not to eat more than spiritual satiation requires. And um, another thing is to avoid eating by yourself. But everybody knows that, uh, that you eat more when you're by yourself. Right? Part of it is you're taking away the communication idea. And so the, uh, the, the biblical way of eating is, first of all, always with other people, number one. Number two, always to make the conversation just as important as the food. And number three, once there is conversation, that helps you attain the third level, the third point, which is to savor the food. In other words, if you watch how some of us have learned or trained ourselves to eat, it's very negative. We uh, spoon a, a fork full of food into our mouth. We are hurriedly chewing it. We can barely wait to swallow it. Why? Because the next fork full is on the way to the mouth already. Slow it down. Just slow it down. Savor it. Chew which it's okay to do if you're in the middle of a conversation and you're listening to somebody talk. You chew with your mouth shut, please. And that's if your mother went to the same mothering school my mother went to. Uh, then um, you're slowing it down. And again, there you are allowing the satiation message, in this case both physical and spiritual, to reach your control centers. It's very important. Um, so much so that this is indicated in the certain language of uh, of the Lord's language of Hebrew, and that is, for instance, you know that in English there is absolutely no reason at all to suppose that words that uh, have different meanings have related meanings. So, instance, if I say I can't bear this, or watch out, there's a bear coming, <laughs> those two words have nothing to do with one another, right? Or if I say, what a fluke, you know, you just managed to uh, hit the, the bullseye on a, on a shooting range, and I don't think your shooting is so good, and you say, what a fluke. Uh, or somebody is uh, boating in the beautiful waters of British Columbia, and a whale surfaces, and he says, quick, look at the whale. And then you'd look, but by that time the whale has, has sounded, and he says, ah, you just saw the fluke. There it goes, the tail of a whale, the fluke of a whale. 
uh, what are those two got to do with one another? Nothing at all, right? Um, come back from the bow of the boat. Uh, you're putting too much weight up there in the bow of the boat, the front end of the boat, right? Or what um, a, uh, a certain uh, president enjoys doing to foreign dignitaries, uh, namely bowing to them. What are those two things? No, nothing. But in Hebrew, it doesn't work like that. In Hebrew, the word for word is exactly the same as the word for bees, words and bees. And as a matter of fact, the fifth book of uh, the five books of Moses is Deuteronomy. And in Hebrew, it's called Devarim, which means words or bees. Now, what have bees and words got to do with one another? They both can produce honey or stings. Get it? Again, that has to do with using your mouth correctly in mode one, namely putting out communication. Words, bees. That's right, honey or stings. Um, another example is the word for bread. Now, bread is always used as, you know, your nourishment, your bread. You earn your daily bread. But we, we, it's an expression not only in Hebrew, but also in English. And in Hebrew, the word for bread, lechem, doesn't only mean bread. It also means battle or war. Uh, what's the idea? And this brings us to exactly the point, to realize that every meal is a mini battle. Every meal I enjoy is a tiny little moral war going on between, well, between the pull of just the physical, which says, eat, 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 and the spiritual, which says, try and derive maximum satisfaction, satiation, and yes, pleasure from every mouthful, thanking the Lord for making that possible recognizing that in eating each and every mouthful you are drawing in physical sustenance from the world in order to maximize spiritual potential yours in other words you're almost playing a role in elevating that stake and allowing it to fulfill a higher purpose namely the nurturing and sustenance of a human being now obviously uh, for a human being that uh, thinks, as uh, as um, uh, Ecclesiastes said, you know, a person who thinks only of his mouth will never be satisfied. Uh, yeah, well, then you know, then he's not doing much good to creation by eating that steak because he's not raising it to a higher level. But somebody whose language is going to be refined and whose language is not going to be. Uh, vulgar and demeaning and uh, obscene, la obscenity laced or profanity laced. Uh, that's a person who's using his mouth correctly on the outs on the output. Therefore, on the input as well, he's more capable of using it correctly. And uh, as we as we begin to approach uh, the the end of today's show. Um, it's also worthwhile remembering that the very first time that God speaks to humanity, the very first time God speaks to his child, to his creature, to his creation, um, is the very first two times, I should say, addresses man's fundamental appetites. Uh, the very first time, the very first time God speaks to, to humanity and to man um, says, he says, uh, be fruitful and multiply. And again, uh, in Hebrew, the fruitful and multiply but are not just synonyms. Remember I said there are no redundancies in Scripture. So it might be poetical to say be fruitful and multiply, but in the Lord's language, actually in the original, it says bond through sex and have children. That's what it's really talking about. So the, the very first statement that God makes to humanity is have sex, you know, connect with one another sexually and have children, marry. And, uh, and so that's acknowledgement of the, the, the physical drive for sex. And then the second one is where, uh, uh, where it says that um, uh, God put a man and put him in the Garden of Eden. And, um, and what did he say? He said, here are the trees that I've put in the Garden of Eden for you, and um, of these you should eat. And we're, I'm looking at uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 16. Uh, all the fruit tree, all the trees of the garden, you, may, you must eat. Now, in, in the English, it very often says you may freely eat or you must surely eat, and that's because the word eat gets repeated. In Hebrew, it's achol tochel. 
and the the word is repeated and so translators don't always know what to make of the repetition of the word eat but now we get a very good idea don't we which is eat and eat you must eat physically and you must eat spiritually right very very important observation you should be aware of chapter 2 verse 16 in uh, in the book of genesis and uh, and that again establishes this basic principle make the spiritual dimension a part of your meal a part of your eating and that'll be the surest way to make sure that cistern b doesn't have a hole drilled into it so as that it can fill up properly and the ball valve could be turned off so as that your desire to continue pushing food into your face diminishes because the satiation that comes from being spiritually fulfilled by that food occurs and is able to uh, end the meal, as it were, at the right time instead of far too late. Well, my dear friends, thank you so much for staying with me throughout this uh, uh, this this complicated program. Uh, make make no mistake about it. Today's show is not easy and uh, particularly difficult to hear for those of us who can indeed and should indeed lose a few pounds, but nonetheless really effective because it is a way that actually does work. So uh, this time in this show, what we really emphasized was fitness, right? Just really focused on fitness. But nonetheless, as you know, all the five Fs are an integral part of a unified and comprehensive life of completion and fulfillment. And so, yes, fitness has to do with family and finance. It has to do with uh, uh, friendship and, yes, even with faith, as we uh, covered during the show. So thanks for being part of such a long show. Thank you for helping to promote the show. Tell folks about it, and thanks for visiting the website at www.rabbidaniellappin.com. So until next week and our next opportunity to be together, you are in my thoughts, and I pray for your progress and uh, success in your five Fs, in your fitness, in your family, in your finances, in your faith, and in your friendships. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.